Hey guys, welcome back to another video and welcome to my first drive slash review on the 2020 Audi A6 Allroad, a very unusual and rare model. Before we start this review, I just want to say once again a massive shout out and thanks to everyone for the support so far in 2020. My subscriber count, my view count has just been off the scale, really has been. And a massive hi and thanks to all of you new CarWow subscribers. I've seen a massive spike in followers and subscribers since I did that CarWow video with Mr. Matt Watson. So thanks a lot and welcome to the channel. While I'm on that, please remember to give us a follow on Instagram as well you'll see a lot of my day-to-day -day stuff, a lot of live Instagram stories, and you'll find out about cars like this A6 Allroad way before it features on my YouTube channel. Looking back at the A6 Allroad's history, it launched back in 1999, which would have made it the Audi A6 C5 generation. It's never sold in massive numbers, but think of it as a more capable a6 Avant Quattro but unlike something like the new RS6 that I've tested recently where that is a far more performance orientated A6 more like a super wagon if you like this all road kind of takes the direction in an opposite way so it's far more capable off the road and has more of an ability on that side of things I think that's why it's called the all road because it literally can go on pretty much all roads okay guys we are now going to take this soft roading the great thing about the a6 all road is it sits roughly two inches higher than your regular a6 avant but when you put this in off-road mode the air suspension lifts it a further 1.8 inches so effectively you're left with a car that's got about seven and a half inches of ground clearance which is really impressive it will do enough off-roading to suit most people's needs so i'm going to put it over into off-road mode now which will lift it up that extra two ish inches right hopefully <laughs> you've seen that on the camera i can certainly feel like i'm sitting a little bit higher Let's go and explore. Okay guys, here we go. Now I'm not by any means saying this is serious off-roading because it's really not, but you definitely couldn't get a normal A6 Avant or any kind of normal car along here because it would just ground out. I would say these tracks are probably six to eight inches deep and this is quite an incline that we're about to hit now this is actually a seriously seriously big incline and we'll see if we can stop we're on summer tires remember so let's just stop here for a second now hopefully at least one of the camera angles should pick up the fact that we are at a seriously steep incline i'm actually looking at the sky i can't see anything else in front of me and to think that i'm in a fairly regular road car all right now let's go no slip at all easy peasy at that just gotta make sure i'm still in the track so i don't hit any of these uh big tree stumps that's really impressive i mean i would love to take it off-roading properly and uh to see you know what it really is capable of but as something that is so smooth and usable on road it's great that with the air suspension it can adapt to something quite useful off the road there are two engine variants available in the UK. This is the range top of 50 TDI. What does that mean? Well, it doesn't really relate to anything, that number, apart from the size of the output, if you like. This has got a three litre V6 turbo diesel engine producing 286 horsepower and 620 newton meters of torque, so a lot of torque. There is a 45 TDI version available, which is a bit cheaper, has a bit less kit on it. And that one produces 228 brake horsepower and a much smaller 500 newton meters of torque. They both share the same engine, just the lower version is obviously detuned. 
This range stopper has a limited top speed of 155 miles an hour and a claimed 0 to 62 figure of 5.9 seconds. It also has a claimed combined fuel efficiency run of 38 miles to the gallon and that's a WLTP figure so a very accurate figure and in fact that's what I've kind of found it to do on the combined cycle from using it for a few days. That's not the most impressive figure for a modern diesel car but part of the reason for that is this car weighs in at just over two tons which actually makes it about 150 kilos heavier than an equivalent A6 Avant Quattro. In terms of price, this 50 TDI starts at about £58,000 on the road, but being a press car, it's got quite a few options down at it, including things like the 20 inch wheels. I know they don't look that big because of the big chunky tires, but these are 20 inch wheels. The lovely pan roof, it has a Bang & Olsen sound system, uh, and things like the technology pack but there's also a number of other smaller options that I'll put in the description below most of which I think should really come standard on a car like this that all brings the grand total of this particular car up to a smidge under £69,000 let's talk about its good and bad bits we'll start with its good bits good bits it's got a cool image I love an A4 or an A6 all road I think they're just really cool and really unique they set themselves out from a world full of boring Range Rovers and dare I say it pretty much any SUV out there on the road today I think these are just it's just something really cool and different about them they're sold in very small numbers so it's very rare that you see another one in fact I've been driving this one around for four days and I've not seen any other A4 or A6 all roads which isn't a great thing for Audi because it means they've probably never sold that many in the UK but it is a good thing as an ownership proposition the next plus point is its ride comfort wow 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 it's its biggest plus point in fact for this car the air suspension does such an incredible job honestly the dampers in this suspension setup just feel better than anything else I've tried on the road they feel so expensive and the car feels so plush very similar to the S6 Avant that I had recently but even more so in terms of comfort it's just unbelievable to think we're on the optional 20 inch wheels I know they've got quite chunky sidewalls but imagine what this would feel like on 19s with even bigger tires yeah its ride quality is unmatched I haven't driven anything in the last five years that comes close to how pliant and comfortable this car is it's all road ability we've already shown you just how capable it is off-road as a fairly regular looking road car but that just opens up a number of avenues and also gives the owner uh, an option to do whatever they need to do on it you put some winter tires on this and it's an absolute weapon whether you're in the snow or you live on a muddy farm like I'm surrounded by at the moment my last real plus point that I can think of is how family friendly it is in here. It's, it's a lovely big space with a big boot. It's nice and airy in here, especially with the pan roof. And I absolutely love it. And I think this would be a fantastic car for doing long distances in. Now let's talk about the bad bits. Now there are quite a few bad bits, unfortunately. That's not to say this is a bad car, as you'll see in my conclusion, but there are a number of smaller bad bits that I thought I had to mention. One of them being throttle response. I don't know what's happened to Audi of late. I don't know if it's to do with the WLTP testing or what, if there's something going on there, but if you've driven a modern Audi diesel, as in one that was sort of produced in the last year, you'll know exactly what I'm talking about there's just no response no initial response from the throttle the gearbox is clumsy the whole setup's really clumsy now this gearbox as far as i know is the zf8 speed it's a fantastic gearbox so we can't blame it on the gearbox itself but there's something to do with the calibration that's just not working right i don't know if it's this 48 volt mild hybrid system that i've never sort of seen the benefit from it could be that um, I just don't know but whatever it is there's such a delay so we're going on here okay so 40 miles an hour put my foot on the throttle a little bit nothing's happening nothing's happening and then put it a bit down and now it shifts down and there's just like 
it's just a massive delay there and I don't understand why or where that's come from you didn't get that kind of delay in a turbo diesel from 20 years ago with an old slush box so there's something that's just not right it, it, and it really does become quite frustrating when you're just trying to flow on a road you just pick up the throttle there's nothing there's nothing there's nothing and then the engine shifts down two gears and then gives you more power and torque than you wanted it does become a bit tiring um, and I just don't seem to understand why it is like it is all I can think of is that it's set up like that so that it meets some kind of WLTP emission standards um, the only way I've found around it is by putting it over into manual and actually using the paddles um, which is nice it's nice to see paddles on this particular car but even then you're in say fourth gear now and I'm at okay so 1600 rpm which in a modern three liter six cylinder turbo it should literally take off from there but fourth gear put my foot on the floor nothing nothing that's foot on the floor 2000 now we're picking up again there's just a real dead spot down low which is where the 48 volt mild hybrid system is meant to help but I just don't see how it, the older systems and the older diesels were much better and a unit like the one in my 7 series the 30d is so much better down low and so much better at responding when you put your foot in the accelerator in my bmw it actually seems to communicate with the engines uh, and the electronics and the car goes down the road i just don't understand that and it is a little bit frustrating because i know that this particular engine is brilliant and this particular gearbox is brilliant but there's just some kind of miscommunication between everything the calibration of something is just not right and i don't know what it is door closing i found this on the rs6 recently as well maybe it's a common problem on all current a6s of the c8 generation I think in my own head that they're all designed, the doors and the closing mechanisms, to have soft close. And when they don't have soft close, like this car and like the RS6 that I had in Germany recently, it doesn't work. So you close the door and the door catch kind of grabs the door but doesn't close it because with a soft close mechanism it would then do its closing. But if you don't have soft close, what happens is it kind of prevents the door from closing properly but then doesn't close it. So you end up, honestly, trying to close the door two or three times sometimes, and you have to slam them shut. I found if you open a window a little bit, it will close a lot easier, or if the boot's open, so if there's no um, sort of air pressure in the car, if you like. But still, that's a really frustrating thing to live with, and in fact, any passengers that I've had in this or in the RS6, they've always got out, closed the door, it hasn't closed, and they've had to slam it shut. And I'm, again, I think there's just something that's not right there um, and I know that if it had the soft close it would work. These seats, although they are very comfortable, much helped by the incredible chassis and suspension, they just offer very, very little support and for me they offer too little. I wish the side bolsters were a bit bigger but I guess that's a half complaint because I think the majority of people that we drive in this car won't be pushing on too hard and won't really notice that the seats don't benefit you or support you enough. That's my next point, ride and handling. Well, we talked about ride, so more so handling. Handling, ride is a plus point. Handling, it's a little bit vague in terms of handling. When you put it into dynamic and it sits lower and you can feel everything's a lot stiffer and it's very supported, but it just feels a bit vague. There's no feeling through the steering whatsoever. And I think it's a little bit unfair because I literally jumped out of the RS6 in Germany, flew back to the UK and the very next day this was delivered. So in my head, and especially as I'm sitting in pretty much identical cabin, in my head I'm still in the RS6. So in isolation, I'm sure this car's not bad at all. And really in terms of how good the ride quality is, you just couldn't expect it to handle uh, in the same manner as an RS6, it's just impossible. So, ride's not bad, it's just a little bit vague, and this is certainly not a car that you're gonna get in on a Sunday for a Sunday morning blast, because it doesn't give you much excitement, especially when you factor in the lack of throttle response and stuff like that, so it kind of, yeah, it, it, it does what it says on the tin, it's very, very comfortable, 
but it's not going to be a car that you're going to get excited about going on a Sunday morning drive. The last negative point I want to point out is the miles per gallon figure. Now they do only quote it at about 38 miles per gallon on the combined and I've certainly not beaten that figure even on long runs, which isn't that impressive when I managed to do about 30 miles per gallon on a long run in the RS6 and in fact in this day and age with modern technology and stuff and this 48 volt mild hybrid system 38 miles a gallon just isn't good enough and in fact the best I've seen on a long run in this car is about 34 and a half we've just had a couple of days of crazy gale force weather and winds and I tell you what I couldn't have chosen to be in a better more insulated car this car is just incredible when it comes to days like that. We know it's ability off-road, but also the fact that this one's got the acoustic double glazing glass, and it wasn't until you opened the window or the door that you realized how crazy the weather was outside, because in here you had very little idea of what was going on out there, because it's such a calm and nice place to be, and the way it rides, etc., it just, it's brilliant. Nothing seemed to phase it through those couple of days of crazy weather. Hopefully you've enjoyed this video today. Please give us a thumbs up if you did. Leave any comments and questions below the description and I will see you at the next one. Cheers guys.